or at a very busy day, you're looking at Charlotte, North Carolina and a podium. We love empty podiums. Coming before that one in just a, a few minutes, Donald Trump, it's part of his urban renewal push, how he will help urban America at a time when uh, polls show that, well, he's helping his cause. He has narrowed the gap in some states. And again, it depends on what you what you look at in North Carolina. In one poll, in that poll, it is virtually even. In another New York Times poll, it's a little wider gap favoring Hillary Clinton. In Florida, uh, the trend certainly of late has been Donald Trump's trend because in the latest Bloomberg survey, uh, he is up by two points. Uh, when you factor in the average of those polls, he trails by a couple of points. But uh, it is the trend that is helping him right now. Susan Frecchio, uh, the Washington Examiner, on all of that. Susan, what do you make of it? Well, the the path is narrow, but the polls are also narrow. So you you know it pretty much gives you some hope that Trump can carve a way to win uh, 270. But you know it's more hopeful than it was a week ago. Right. Um, but it's still a tough race for him because he needs to win uh, these key battleground states, and he's not leading decisively really in the states that he really needs to win in. In Florida, it's about tied. In North Carolina, it's about tied. In Pennsylvania, she's leading. So, you know, there are areas where he really needs to improve his performance, uh, Pennsylvania being the key state. But these polls um, certainly offer hope for Trump supporters because, look, now he's leading a little bit in Florida. Florida is a must win for both Clinton and Trump. So that's, that's a real battle there. Um, and North Carolina, which has been the, one of the closest states in past elections, barely half a point victory in 2008. Right. Romney won it back in 2012. It's really a purple state. It's really up for grabs. So this is going to be a very close race in all these very important battleground states. But you cannot rule out a Trump win. You know, the one thing that's interesting uh, is, is, is getting at the numbers behind the numbers. Uh, one consistent thing, I think, is from some of these state polls is that independents are cutting his way. Now, I don't know whether that's enough to close the deal or reverse uh, what had been, you know, some, some tough numbers for him. But that does seem to be a, a more consistent theme, even in Arizona, where he's eked out into it slightly. What do you make of that? Well, independents were, are, are, they're key. They're considered key to victory for either candidate. Um, and he has, if you look at polling over the course of this campaign, he has managed to do pretty well with the independent vote. And I think that's an important factor that a uh, few people have raised. I'm glad you brought that up, Neil, because I think that's an important part of this election. A lot of pollsters have been telling me all along this whole race boils down to undecided voters in these key battleground states, and many of those undecided voters are independents. So if he's winning a little bit there, that's certainly going to show up on Election Day and yeah. work to his advantage. Real quickly, what do you think is driving? And now he's been sticking to a lot of issues of late. This covers a period that would be before some of that. But uh, yeah. we've also seen some of the, the drag effect of these uh, Affordable Care Act revelations. It's going to cost a lot more than we thought. To say nothing of the, the, the WikiLeak emails we're going to get into in a second here. But what do you what, what is driving this? Well, it's a combination of all those things. It's shorter news cycles. We're getting further away from the debates now. Yeah. Everybody predicted the polls were going to tighten in these final few days, and, and, and indeed they are. Um, but I think, as you just said, the drip drip of information coming from the James O'Keefe videos and the WikiLeaks stuff, which is really playing well on social media, even though it's not getting a lot of play in mainstream media, right. I think that's all contributing to uh, his ability to close the gap. Well put. Uh, Susan, great catching up with you again. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right, we were talking about these weekly emails that are out, including some rather embarrassing stuff coming from Hillary Clinton's own staff and advisors, one calling her the emailer in chief. You've heard the drill, but Ed Henry has been going through all of this. Uh, he's in Washington with the very latest, what he's finding out. Ed. Neil, good to see you. You're absolutely right. I think the big picture here is we've seen from the beginning of these WikiLeaks releases the idea that something is going on privately that's different than what's happening publicly for Hillary Clinton. Remember at the beginning uh, with the Wall Street transcript, she was talking about having a public position and a private position. Uh, we see some of that as well in terms of how they handled the email scandal. You mentioned uh, one of her advisors, Philippe Reines, uh, March 5th, uh, 2015. This is right as the email controversy exploded.
said, quote, EINC is in the email in chief in a very good place about all of this, which gives us a sense that maybe at the beginning, just days after the New York Times revealed uh, that she used a private email account while doing official business at the State Department, that they were wrong about how this was only, all going to play out. Two days later, the same advisor, though, uh, when pressed a, a, in a back and forth with other advisors, said, quote, there is just no good answer in terms of the server. We need to gut through the process phase, get them all out there, and let the content do the talking. This is March 7th. Then watch what Hillary Clinton said. Three days later, March 10th, 2015, after her advisor said we have no good answers, she went out and insisted she had the answers. Watch. I have uh, absolute confidence that everything that could be in any way uh, connected to work is now in the possession of the uh, State Department. So you can see, uh, she said she turned everything over. That's been questioned. Uh, she also said there was no classified information on the server. That's obviously uh, had major holes po poked through it. And so you see what they were saying in private and what she came out and told the American people in public was a little bit different. Neil. Ed, thank you very much, Ed Henry. Meanwhile, did any of you see this uh, Hollywood Walk of Fame, a man with a pickaxe smashing Donald Trump's star on that illustrious location completely to bits, like God? I don't know who it was. Uh, they're still trying to ascertain wh what point he showed up, probably before dawn. Uh, but Media Research Center's Brent Bozell says at least that is a physical representation of the trashing Donald Trump has been receiving. Look in the media, it's even worse. Brent, uh, when you look at the kind of hit pieces that have come up on Donald Trump, whether you're for that sort of thing or not, it is imbalanced here. We don't see any of that magnitude with stories on Hillary Clinton doing. No question about it. My colleague Rich Noyes did a, a huge study uh, since the convention, and the numbers speak for themselves. You've got 40% more coverage of Donald Trump than Hillary Clinton. Two and a half times more airtime be given to controversies, two and a half times about Trump over her. 91% negative coverage of Donald Trump. Now, she has gotten negative coverage as well, but it's buried under an avalanche of coverage that Donald Trump is getting. And meanwhile, real stories revolving around Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration are being forgotten. You know what's kind of weird is when I talk to other journalists about this, I, I don't think they enter this and wake up in the morning, how can I stick it to Donald Trump? I like to think that's not the case. I, so it isn't so much an agenda as much as it is a sort of a, a disconnect uh, that a lot of them have that go after Donald Trump on this stuff because it's easier to tell the story um, because you can use his words. And yet I'm told that it, the, 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 the WikiLeaks stuff, that gets kind of convoluted. And I, I went back and went and said, what is so convoluted about explaining pay to play? Uh, those are basic kind of concepts that don't take a lot of set up and detail to get into. But nevertheless, it is what it is. Well, you know, a couple of points on that. I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. I used to say that about the media. They don't get up and have breakfast and say, how can we screw conservatives? Well, in fact, yes, they do. One of the things that we're learning from this, I was trying to be kind. Things, uh, I was trying to be kind. <laughs> Well, well, but, but we've learned there at least, at least now that we've tabulated, at least a dozen instances now where we have discovered that the meet with the media working with the Clinton campaign in doing their stories, including reporters who submit their stories to the Clinton campaign for vetting before publishing them. It's just an extraordinary development that we found. Secondly, where things like Benghazi are concerned, again, it's stunning to me. I'm not trying to diminish these accusations from these women and Donald Trump. However, put things in their proper context in this campaign. What is more important, that or a Clinton Foundation pay to play or what's going on in Benghazi with the Benghazi investigation, with the emails, with her servers, put all those things together and combined they are less than Donald Trump and accusations from women from 15, 20 years ago. It's a stunning development to me. But it is interesting to me that the media didn't waste a nanosecond getting all of these women who made these charges on the air fast. Fine, fine. Uh, but when it came to the WikiLeaks stuff, they wanted, you know, uh, vetted and vetted again and checked and rechecked. The same zeal certainly didn't apply to getting, uh, that, the, 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 you know, Donald Trump's taxes out when they did. They didn't care about the source or how they got out. They just pounced on it. So sure. a bit of a double standard. And now, Neil, 
Yeah, Neil. Now let's compare the way that they're covering Donald Trump and women and the way they covered Bill Clinton and women. Let's go back to Monica Lewinsky. Let's go back to the Juanita Broderick nun rape story in the 1990s. Back then, the attitude of the, movie, of, the, of, of the media was, that's ancient history, move on, move on. That's ancient history. It's not verified. It's one person's work. They didn't do stories. Move on, move on, move on. That's where we got the term moveon.org, was from the media promoting the idea and projecting the idea that this was not important. Look what they're doing with Donald Trump. They are doing the exact opposite. Now, it doesn't matter where you fall in this campaign or right. this ideology. You simply cannot have this kind of double standard and call it fair, balanced, objective journalism. And the numbers bear it out. It's not even close. I mean, if you want to go after Donald Trump, fine, but, yeah. but it's not even close. Uh, Brent, thank you very right. much, my friend. Brent Bozell. You know the good thing about being a nerd here, and again, I'm the Fox resident nerd, I'm okay, I'm comfortable with that, is I, I, I'm pretty good at math. So when they were cooking all this healthcare stuff up, um, I was doing basic math. Again, very basic math, like, like math 101. Actually, fifth grade math. And it wasn't adding up. Why are we so surprised now? Did anyone listen to me then? The details now. The president has also put forward an idea uh, that um, in those places where there is not as much competition, that uh, we should set up a mechanism where there can be a public option that would give consumers in those locations an additional choice. Have the option, in, especially in states where there's only one person offering under the law, the opportunity to get a public option which would always be competitively priced and which would be part of a huge pool. All right. Do you think this is all an accident? Do, do you think that this suddenly, all, all of a sudden came up, they looked at these premium increases and said, we need, we need a single payer. We need a, a, a public option. Well, I did warn you about this about six years ago when they were cooking this up. Flashback time. You mentioned the single payer thing, and that, uh, and I suspected, and Dave, I'll raise this with you, when I was covering the vote and the debate on the Hill, that this was ultimately the goal anyway. And even though that, that some Democrats had expressed uh, disappointment that, that we didn't end up getting a single payer system, that it was like a Trojan horse deal ultimately leading to that. Hello. That's where we are now, Virginia Republican Congressman David Bratt. Congressman, I, I mean... This is very obvious here. I think that it was convenient that all these problems cropped up. I think problems that that they knew when they were cooking it up, they would they would materialize. And then we were knee deep in this. You couldn't just junk it, even though a lot of Republicans, no doubt like yourself, want to do just that. And the alternative would be, well, the public option thing. And the public option would have been a tough sell back then. It's like a desperation Hail Mary pass now. But I think it was planned all along. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you got to look at what the alternatives are, right? Free markets work and have worked for 200 years to make countries rich. And there's no alternative that you can name. So you can come up with all these names. Marxism wasn't designed to fail, right? Communism and socialism weren't designed to fail. They just do fail because there's no country you can name where they work. Yeah. And so Gruber, though, uh, the architect, I mean, he did say back in the design phase that it, you, the American people are so stupid, they actually think this thing will work. Well, and so he, unfortunately, he never uh, planned on that, th those remarks coming out. But you're quite right. Behind the scenes, I always suspected that they knew it was going to be a lot of unpleasant surprises like you and your professor days back then. I, I think a lot of people were just doing basic math and concluding that the numbers didn't add up. But now what happens? Right. I mean, Donald Trump is about to, to speak in North Carolina. He's talking about urban renewal. But one of the things he raised yesterday is that Washington, it's kind of the same old thing. Um, and just doubling down on the same old thing. Do you think that's yep. resonating with folks? Uh, not really. And uh, there's a huge split, even on liberals, right? My old faculty colleagues, the senior guys, used to be true liberals. They actually used to believe in a little bit of liberty and stuff. Uh, but now you got two versions of liberalism up for debate. You got Bernie and the socialists on the left, and they're, but they're ironically fighting for the small guy, right? And on the other hand, you got Hillary. She's clearly a, a, a creature of K Street and Wall Street and the crony and the lawyers. Uh, and that's what the whole country is revolting against right now. And so the left, it's no mistake, right? The left is after control. 
And sector after sector after sector, what are they doing? They're getting rid of the small guys in banking. Well, the what do you banks recommend are going here, under? Congressman? The, 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 the talk is that Donald Trump wants to just junk this thing, you know, crash it, burn it, be done with it. Other Republicans have come back and said, be careful where you go with that one because you could leave 15 to 20 million people without medical coverage uh, and all these others getting hit with high premium increases. What, what would you do? Yeah, I mean, you do health savings accounts. I have a bill in with Senator Flake to do that. You put park some money in there for every person. You give every person catastrophic insurance along with HSA, and then you have a more free market solution. But the left, it, it's important to realize what's going on, right? They're, they're trying to get a few large firms to run every sector, healthcare, a few large insurance agents, a few large hospitals, a few large banks, because then the left can control uh, the entire economy. Now they control one sixth of the economy called health care. They're doing the same thing in finance, banking, etc. The, the small guy is being put out of business systematically. They know that. Uh, you don't have to own the means of production anymore. You just have to regulate it. And so that's why you have the executive branch doing this executive overreach. They are controlling the economy by regulatory fiat. That's what's going on. That's the new left. My Democratic friends in my churches and schools and community, they don't get what's going on that way. Well, do you think that this, nice this development, uh, uh, you know, what's happening here with the implosion of the Affordable Care Act, it's not affordable, um, right. is, is, is what's helping Donald Trump, what's hurting Hillary Clinton. Some of these polls are tightening, not all, but, but that this yeah. is a, a potential game changer. Oh, it's a huge game changer, and it's systematic of what's going on yeah. and what you should expect from Hillary. If she were to win, this is the game plan, right? Centralized power in Washington, D.C., contrary to the Tenth Amendment, where all power is supposed to go to the states and to the people. And uh, Republicans have to do a better job of messaging what's actually going on. And even on my own side, right, there's been a huge reaction now. The Trump phenomenon, 80 percent of outsider voters on the Republican side, we're running a $600 billion deficit, and we're not fighting on behalf of the American people. So uh, hmm. when leadership comes back, uh, I hope to see a pivot on our side, and I hope to see them saying, we're going to fight for the American people, because uh, that's what the American people are demanding right now. All right. Well, the action certainly will be in the House. Let's put it in mildly. Um, yep. Congressman, thank you very much. Good catching up with you. Hey, you too, Neil. Thanks. Always great to be on. Same here. All right. On the left side of your screen here, waiting for Donald Trump speaking in Charlotte, North Carolina, about an urban renewal project trying to bring our cities back and help those who are disadvantaged there. Donald Trump saying there's a reason why uh, our cities have quadruple the unemployment rate, particularly among young uh, men and particularly young African-American men. What he plans to do, an outline in Charlotte, North Carolina, to change that, we're there. When he's there, stick around. You are watching your world. Trump uh, on this side of the globe in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he is talking up an urban renewal effort that would help cities like Charlotte and would help a lot of the cities in some of the battleground states uh, that Donald Trump has been making inroads in in some late polls here. We've got XL Alliance co-founder Enrique Arbelez, Democratic strategist Dima Amara, and Republican strategist Gianna Caldwell. Gianna, Wendy, would you begin with you then? How important is it for Donald Trump to lay this out, to talk urban renewal, and to address an audience that by and large uh, doesn't hear that kind of thing, at least from Republicans? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hugely important, and I'm glad to see him taking this very significant step. I think during this election cycle, the biggest constituency group that loses out here is my community, the African-American community. Here's why. Black lives don't matter to Hillary Clinton. Black votes matter to Hillary Clinton. And because black votes matter to Hillary Clinton, when Donald Trump, to his credit, been the most vocal Republican candidate running for president to mention things about unemployment in the uh, African-American community, crime and otherwise, when he brings those things up and when Mike Pitts bring up the, the need for criminal justice reform because there's 2.3 million people in the American prison system, about a million of those folks are African-American, Hillary Clinton doesn't respond with policy positions. She responds with rhetoric like, Donald Trump, you're racist, which is disenfranchising the African-American community because there's not a debate on urban renewal and saving our communities. Tina, how much traction is this sort of stuff getting? I ask because at least in one of the polls, I believe in Arizona, uh, where it's mm -hmm. still tight, and it, it probably shouldn't be this tight in a, in a largely Republican state, 
uh, lo and behold, I discover that Donald Trump is getting one out of three Hispanic voters. Uh, what do you make of that? Because that's a lot more uh, than any prior Republican candidate has achieved in modern times. What's going on? <laughs> well, I don't think uh, Hispanic voters are particularly monolithic. Um, I do think when you're looking at some place like Florida, which is also a very important state for Donald Trump to win, you've got about all of the absentee ballots that are coming in from Florida Hispanic voters, and 99% of them are, are have already voted more than they have in 12, and they seem to be projected to be voting Democrat. How, how would you know that? Results. Though, how would you know they're voting Democrat? That that's just been from uh, the tracking numbers that have been coming out. So the majority. Of them have been tracked by those the campaigns if, obviously if democratic these. ballots. No, I don't mean to badge you on that, but if they're democratic oh. ballots, I mean it, 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 we we often make the assumption, which is a good one, right, but true. the assumption that they're going to be yeah. democratic votes, when in fact that sometimes is not the case. Right. Well, I think by and large you can look at numbers from you know certainly the campaign and how he's been doing with Hispanic voters. Um, to be able to sort of read that, but again, I obviously it is you know worth right. noting that the Hispanic community is not monolithic. I did want to go back to Giano's point that I think that um, I'd actually disagree that you know Black Lives don't matter to Hillary Clinton. I mean, it was her campaign that has been traveling with mothers of the movement. You know, she went out to Flint, Michigan early, way before Donald Trump. You know, so, she definitely so, has put forward policy so, plans so, so, on so, discussing. Okay, so, so to that to that point, did she she apologized for this '94 crime bill, but she was eight years a year. U.S. Senator, never mentioned it, never put forth one policy solution to reverse the draconian that's, effects that's on our community. On our, yes, it is true. You well, guys, I do want to go back to this. I don't want to leave. Guys, guys, uh, that when she's I want to bring in Rico, then she needs black right, votes. That's when you to apologize. I beg you to stop. I'm going to have to put You're both going to bed now without dinner. I'm sorry. I just had to do it. Enrique, if you could pipe down. Let me ask you, Enrique. You hear this and you, you know, this back and forth on on these polls, and I know we over obsess them, I'm guilty of it as well. But if there is a narrowing going on, not in all states, in some states, uh, certainly in Florida, potentially in North Carolina, what, what is going on? Is it just a natural, you know, kind of tightening you would expect in a race? We saw this in, in multiple races in the past. I mean, what is going on in your opinion? Look, it's a very tight race, and it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's America being divided right now. But I, I do want to say that, you know, Trump has a big, big issue with the votes from minorities, and particularly with the Latino community. And when you talk about urban renewal, you have to talk about the terms of construction and qu what construction can do to jobs in the Latino community. When you think about the fact that over 30 percent of the employees in the construction industry happen to be uh, Hispanic, so that's a very important area when it comes to job creation. And now. He also needs to talk about gentrification because that's another big concern with urban cities and communities that could get displaced by these projects. But if you're able to put it in context of job, job creation and be able to mitigate the concerns over gentrification, then it could be definitely a strong point that can help a little bit. Gianna, when we talk about an urban policy and talk about a Republican initiating one, yeah. Hillary Clinton has said this is a Republican who doesn't mean what he says uh, and how he has treated his own workers, she says, is proof of that. Does he have to bring that sort of thing up? Does he have to remind people what he's built just in Washington today with this Washington hotel that was kind of formally open today, um, that, that uh, he, does, he does help folks out. He does, you know, encourage a more urban and, and, and American hiring. And these aren't jobs that, 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 are, that are shifted away or right. worse, uh, workers who aren't paid. Well, if, if I were him, I would remind everyone that black lives don't matter to Hillary Clinton. Black votes matter to Hillary Clinton. I would also mention the fact of this work that he did with Rainbow Push years ago with Jesse Jackson saying that he was an individual that, um, that, that he can call, meaning Jesse Jackson said that Donald Trump was an individual he can call when it came to jobs and bringing forth jobs in our community. That's what I would remind people of. And I will also remind people of what Hillary Clinton and her supportive policies that have decimated the African-American community. I know. What? Yeah. Okay. I hear what you're saying. Uh, Unfortunately, we're pushing with time. I want, want to get you back another time. Not, no slight right, to anyone. I appreciate it, though. We are waiting here Thank for Donald Trump. We're totally, that's not too far away. We're also going to be talking to the guy who's really uh, changing the context of this race in Utah. Meet him next. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, by the way, with that Saturday live coverage, I will have made up for all the days I was out this summer, so I don't need any lectures <laughs> from any of you people at home. Uh, meanwhile, back to uh, this presidential race and what's going on. Uh, we're getting word that Mike Pence, the Republican vice presidential candidate, is going to be in Salt Lake City, uh, Utah, making an appearance today. Now, why Salt Lake and why Utah? What's going on there? Well, I, I think this gentleman could explain it. Evan McMullen, independent presidential candidate who, uh, depending on the polls, is either running a tight second or out, uh, winning that state. Uh, that is a, a shocker, no matter how you put it, uh, because that's not supposed to happen. With us now, Evan McMullen, independent candidate for the presidency of the United States. Evan, good to have you back. Nice to be with you, Neil. Neil, I heard uh, you say to your two uh, former guests or your two prior guests that if they misbehaved, you were going to deny them dinner. I hope that's not the outcome of our uh, discussion today. No, I'll include breakfast for you. Uh, but <laughs> okay. let me get a sense of what's going on. Obviously, you're well known in your state. You're from this area, a graduate of uh, Brigham Young. You're Mormon, of course, very popular in, in, in the state. But it's uh, to hear even those who love you to death, it's one and done here. You don't have much pull beyond Utah. What do you say to that? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I would say that I wasn't well known in the state. Yes, I was born here and I went to school here and I have ties here, but you know, I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have national name ID or state uh, name ID here either. We've worked very hard for that. We're a three month presidential campaign. We don't have the support of a political party. We don't have the support of major political or Republican party donors, for example. Uh, we are conservative independents. And so our resources have been limited, but we've been supported by the good people of America who are looking well, for another option. How many state option. ballots are you on, Evan? Could you just update me on that? Yeah, we're, we're on 11 ballots, and then we're registered as a write-in in another number, and the total number of ballots on which we have access, either as a registered write-in or appearing directly on the ballot, is 43 states. And so we're very excited about that. The vast majority of Americans will be able to cast a vote for me on Election Day if they choose. Do you think, though, that as, as we look at this race, and it stays tight in your state, uh, despite being on only 11 ballots, and of course you could write in in 30 some odd other states, that you might be the first independent candidate since George Wallace to score electoral votes. Uh, that is, of course, if you win Utah. How likely do you think that is? Well, I would point out just that George Wallace was not actually an independent. He had a party behind him. We don't even have that. Have that. So, uh, so you know, that's a, a distinction. But how likely is it? Look, we're running neck and neck right now. We're either tied uh, statistically or just winning outright in the polls here in Utah. I think we've got more work to be done. We're going to be working hard here for the next two weeks and in the broader Mountain West especially. Uh, we're not taking anything for granted. We're, we're very humbled and encouraged by the support we have such thus far but look there's more work to be done and you know two weeks is a long time in a race no, like no, you're this. right about that but few would have seen where you are now i guess what i wanted to ask though that a lot of mormons are gravitating you not just because you're a mormon i don't mean to typecast you in that way but that they have a tough time embracing hillary clinton and given some of the language out of mr trump i'm told many of them led by the likes of mitt romney uh can't support him how much of that is is helping you that that you have an electorate there by and large not enthusiastic about either of the main party candidates well i would just caution uh, pe people a lot of people in the media are asking me this question about well is it you know is it just the mormon thing and i appreciate neil what you said that you weren't trying to typecast me but it's more about typecasting the voters i mean there are people across this country who hear our message and who are supporting us of all different races and but religions it particularly and particularly resonates in in utah well, that's because this is where we've been spending our time. Right. And the reason we've been spending our time is because here in the Mountain West, people rejected both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And, and that's our whole message is that we're having a leadership crisis in this country. It's time for a new generation of leaders. It's time for a new conservative movement that's actually dedicated to conservatism, to the, the fact that all human beings are created equal, to the cause of individual liberty, limited government, this sort of thing. That's what we're fighting for. That's what resonates with people in this region and people in Utah. But it doesn't it's you know you can draw some connections to different faiths okay. evangelicals mormons catholics but it's just not that simple because we got a lot of people supporting us but 
If it means, you know, you know the traditional rap against uh, third party, whatever, outside the main party candidates, uh, they are just spoilers. That's how it is always seen, um, fairly or not, that, that they, they are, uh, they would hand a, a race to, in your case, a state that, that Donald Trump should win. If you continue surging, uh, you hand it to Hillary Clinton. That's the logic. And you elect her president of the United States. What do you say? I would just say we've got to break out of this idea that we have two major parties and that's it. If the major parties were doing a good job of offering good, honest, wise leaders to the American people, then that would be one thing. If they were getting the job done and effectively governing this country, that would be another. The fact is they're failing us. We need but something new. But who's closer new. to what to you like? Ever, regardless of what happens, if, if you had your own brothers and looking at the major party candidates, uh, I'm, I'm talking Hillary Clinton or, or Donald Trump, who do you dislike less? Well, again, Neil, I got to say, I'm rejecting this idea that it has to be one or the other. This is how we got into this mess, because we, we are so committed to the idea that it has to be one or the other. We've I, I know, but you're not going to be failing. president of the United States. But, you're not going to be elected but let president. Me, but let me, answer your, well, let's, let me answer your question, Neil. The point is that both of these two candidates are big government liberals. That's the reality. Donald Trump, too. Hillary Clinton, as well. We know this. Donald Trump has been a big government liberal his entire life. Who's more are of a liberal? Really Who's more of a liberal? I, well, I, I, Donald Trump says he wants to double the size of, of Hillary Clinton's transportation budget while also lowering taxes, while also raising our national debt. So you tell me, this is a person in Donald Trump who has supported late-term abortions. He's been opposed to the Second Amendment. Look, they're cut from the same cloth. This is how we got into this crisis, by again thinking it's got to be one or the other in part, and there are other things too. We have got to stand up in this country, especially as conservatives, for what we really believe in, for the very principles that have made this country special. Special. For the very principles that have made this country the most powerful and prosperous on earth, we need to reject both of these candidates. If the race is very close, we can block them both. If it isn't, no matter who it is, then we believe that it's time for a new conservative movement because either way, we're getting another big government liberal in the White House. So when you look at this race and what could happen, let's say Donald Trump loses. Uh, um, you don't make it, but, but, but Hillary Clinton wins. Um, do you think that the Republican Party, as some have, have, have posited, they fear it actually, uh, goes away or crumbles and then maybe a third party or another party or a new party emerges, maybe you would play a role in that? What do you think? I I think that's very possible, Neil. I will, we'll just have to wait and see how it plays out. I know that a new conservative movement is necessary. It may be necessary for a new party. We need to keep in mind that even the Republican Party, it, it started when the Whig Party wanted to You're reconstitute right slavery. You're right. And so, we, and ironically, we find ourselves in a position here where we have a Republican nominee who enjoys the support of the white supremacist, white nationalist movement, and he won't fully repudiate this. He won't call, and his running mate, uh, Mike Pence, won't, uh, won't disavow vow uh, the support of David Duke and say that he's deplorable, even something as basic as that. Ironically, we find ourselves again fighting over this issue, uh, this truth that all men and women are created equal. And if the Republican Party is going to continue to embrace a populist, white nationalist message and movement, then there's no way constitutionalists like myself and other true conservatives who believe in the founding principles that have made this country so great, there's no way that we can be a part of that. Evan, thank you very much. Evan McMullen, the uh, independent presidential candidate, and he could just win uh, Utah outright. Uh, thank you, Evan. Very good, very good having you. Thank you, Neil. All right. Uh, we are waiting to hear from Donald Trump, by the way, uh, and, and, and he is going to outline this urban renewal push of his. Also keeping an eye on Apple stock today, down today, but something that was in that report that might portend a very, very good Christmas retail season. I'll explain after this. You know, yesterday this time we were focusing on uh, what ended up being disappointing news out of Apple, that its revenues uh, were down. First time uh, since 2001 we had seen something like that, and that its earnings were down at the same time. A one-two combo that was not greeted favorably by the street, but what was lost in the argument was Apple's otherwise upbeat forecast, especially for holiday sales, a rather robust forecast at that. Heath Herzog, uh, retail watch extraordinaire on that. You know, I was thinking, knowing you were coming, either that we... We've seen a number of other the big box stores, uh, Amazon.com, uh, online retailers announcing big hiring plans for Christmas. So they must see something in us 
that we're going to be doing uh, this holiday. What is it? Uh, the, well, the consumer is certainly robust. And, you know, to your point, the big number, especially with Apple, was $78 billion. That's what Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, was projecting they were going to make revenues on just from the holiday season. And part of the reason there is because iPhone sales account for almost 50% of sales that happen within you know the quarter. So yeah, people, especially Tim Cook and the rest of the retail world are expecting the consumer to really spend uh, hardcore during the retail season. And Neil, they're not just going into the stores, I have to point out, they're going online as well. Yeah, well, uh, that's a lot easier and you don't have to put up with the hell of going in a store. But, but leaving that aside, you know, a lot of Apple stuff, especially now this week, revamping their entire uh, PC line, that's expensive stuff. It's not inexpensive stuff. Their phone's not inexpensive stuff. And I'm wondering what that days and, and, and indeed they are. Um, but I think, as you just said, the drip drip of information coming from the James O'Keefe videos and the WikiLeaks stuff, which is really playing well on social media, even though it's not getting a lot of play in mainstream media. Right. I think that's all contributing to uh, his ability to close the gap. Well put. Uh, Susan, great catching up with you again. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right, we were talking about these WikiLeaks emails that are out, including some rather embarrassing stuff coming from Hillary Clinton's own staff and advisors, one calling her the emailer in chief. You've heard the drill, but Ed Henry has been going through all of this. Uh, he's in Washington with the very latest, what he's finding out. Ed. Neil, good to see you. You're absolutely right. I think the big picture here is we've seen from the beginning of these WikiLeaks releases the idea that something is going on privately that's different than what's happening publicly for Hillary Clinton. Remember at the beginning uh, with the Wall Street transcripts. Which has been the, one of the closest states in past elections, barely half a point victory in 2008. Right. Romney won it back in 2012. It's really a purple state. It's really up for grabs. So this is going to be a very close race and all these very important battlegrounds states, but you cannot rule out a Trump win. You know, the one thing that's interesting uh, is, is, is getting at the numbers behind the numbers. Uh, one consistent thing I think from some of these state polls is that independents are cutting his way. Now, I don't know whether that's enough to close the deal or reverse uh, what had been, you know, some, some tough numbers for him. But that does seem to be a, a more consistent theme, even in Arizona, where he's eked out into it slightly. What do you make of that? Well, independents were, are, are, they're key. They were considered key to victory for either candidate. Um, and he has, if you look at polling over the course of this campaign, he has managed to do pretty well with the independent vote. And I think that's an important factor that uh, few people have raised. I'm glad you brought that up, Neil, because I think that's an important part of this election. A lot of pollsters have been telling me all along this whole race boils down to undecided voters in these key battleground states, and many of those undecided voters are independents. So if he's winning a little bit there, that's certainly going to show up on election day and yeah. work to his advantage. Real quickly, what do you think is driving? And now he's been sticking to a lot of issues of late. This covers a period that would be before some of that. But uh, yeah. we've also seen some of the, the drag effect of these uh, uh, Affordable Care Act revelations. It's going to cost a lot more than we thought. To say nothing of the, the, the WikiLeaks emails we're going to get into in a second here. But what do you what, what is driving this? Well, it's a combination of all those things. It's shorter news cycles. We're getting further away from the debates now. Yeah. Everybody predicted the polls were going to tighten in these final few. All of that. Susan, what do you make of it? Well, the, the path is narrow, but the polls are also narrow. So, you, you know, it pretty much gives you some hope that Trump can carve a way to win uh, 270. But, you know, it's more hopeful than it was a week ago. Right. Um, but it's still a tough race for him because he needs to win uh, these key battleground states, and he's not leading decisively, really, in the states that he really needs to win in. In Florida, it's about tied. In North Carolina, it's about tied. In Pennsylvania, she's leading. So, you know, there are areas where he really needs to improve his performance, uh, Pennsylvania being the key state. But these polls um, certainly offer hope for Trump supporters because, look, now he's leading a little bit in Florida. Florida is a must-win for both Clinton and Trump. So that's a real battle there. Um, and North Carolina... All right, a very busy day. You're looking at Charlotte, North Carolina, and a podium. We love empty podiums. Coming before that one in just a, a few minutes, Donald Trump, it's part of his urban renewal push, how he will help urban America at a time when uh, polls show that, well, he's helping his cause. He has narrowed the gap in some states. And again, it depends on what you, what you look at. In North Carolina, 
In one poll, in Abbott poll, it is virtually even. In another New York Times poll, it's a little wider gap favoring Hillary Clinton. In Florida, uh, the trend certainly of late has been Donald Trump's trend because in the latest Bloomberg survey, uh, he is up by two points. Uh, when you factor in the average of those polls, he trails by a couple of points. But uh, it is the trend that is helping him right now. Susan Frecchio at uh, the Washington Examiner.